Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I will give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Sarah Marcella. She is a portrait photographer who found a school bus last year to transform for a life on the road. She empowers women and non-binary individuals through pay-what-you-can boudoir photography. So I'm excited to talk to Sarah today about her life and other things that she's got going on. So thank you so much for being here, Sarah. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about your story? Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited. Um, so yeah, I have been living on and off the road now for about a year. I found the bus um, in May of of last year. And, uh, right after doing, um, three months living out of my Subaru and, uh, built a little bed in the back and did like two months fully living out of the Subaru, which was amazing. But after doing that for two months, I decided like I needed something a little bit bigger. So instead of just going for a van, I decided that I was going to start my own business. Um, I've been a photographer now for about eight years in DC. Um, and I decided I was going to kind of pivot my business into doing boudoir photography. So found my school bus. It's a 30 foot freight liner. Uh, her name is Shakti, which is the highest divine feminine power in the universe and transformed the inside. I bought her, uh, she was already built out, but I didn't like their build out. There's a lot of unused space. And so completely destroyed their build out. And uh, with the help of some friends and my incredible father and a lot of hard work, we built the bus out in two and a half months. And since then, uh, I've driven across the country twice, uh, out to California and then back for where I'm at currently, which is in Maryland. And tomorrow I am starting my tour back across to California, hitting 15 different cities, doing uh, pay what you can boudoir photography the entire way. So obviously like a very interesting change of pace last year, but I want to start with the Subaru adventure. What was it like living out of a Subaru for a few months? Honestly, it was so easy. Like I miss it. (laughs) I miss it so much. So my Subaru Forester, everything was so much easier living in that small of a space. Um, I woke up when the sun got up and I went to bed when the sun went down because I also did this in January, February, and March. So it was very cold um, traveling the country in the Subaru. And I, I cooked all my meals outside and every, I mean, I did everything outside. Like I went, I went to the bathroom outside. Like I didn't have to worry about anything besides just having my bed inside of the bus. Uh, I had very limited uh, material objects, obviously living in a Subaru. Um, So I pretty much had like my camera gear, some camping gear, and then enough clothes to stay warm. And that's about it. Um, I really enjoyed that experience. I learned a lot about myself and it was very grounding. And then I, I, really thought about, okay, so can I live out of the Subaru for like another six months? And my answer was yes, I could totally do it. I could take out my front seat, put in a refrigerator so I have better food storage. However, the biggest question was, how are you going to make money then? And as a photographer living in DC, I was doing commercial photography and doing a lot of like work for publications. So that was steady income. And I decided that the only way that I was going to be able to provide for myself on the road was to pivot my photography business into something that I could do on the road. So doing boudoir photography as an adventure boudoir experience is what I came up with. However, I wanted a place that I could photograph clients inside of my rig. So inside of the bus and also meet with clients and and, um, just have a safe space for them to come and talk to me about what they wanted out of their shoot. So originally the bus started as the photography studio. I was shooting in the bus for most of my, most of my sessions. And then, um, that kind of changed because this specific tour that I'm on right now, uh, I was in, uh, New Mexico and got a phone call from my partner and she told me she was deploying in two weeks. 
And instead, I, so I was already three days into my trip and I turned around and came back to California and picked up our two dogs and um, decided that we were getting rid of our apartment and I was going to live on the road for the next six months. So now I'm about five and a half to six months in living on the road with my two pit bulls and my partner uh, will be back in, I think we were counting down. So I think it's 27 days at this point. Um, and that has been quite an adventure, but yeah, living in the Subaru was so it was honestly easy. Like if you've ever been interested in doing any type of van life, I would highly suggest just trying it out in the car first, because you'll realize what you need and what you don't need. And honestly, I, I think most people who are, who are in that mindset of trying van life, it, you'll fall in love with it. And so what sort of things did you do outside of the van for daily amenities, we'll call them. So like taking a shower or washing your clothes and things like that. So laundromats to wash my clothes, uh, go to laundromat, just hang out. I would get on my computer. I, I really didn't mind laundromats at all. Uh, and then I have a Planet Fitness membership. So I've got like the black card so I can go to any Planet Fitness location in the country. And that's where I took all my showers. Um, since I've been living out of the bus, if I decide I need a shower prior to stopping at a Planet Fitness, uh, I stop at truck stops. So those are the two ways that I've showered in the past. And then just recently, I actually just installed an outdoor shower for the bus. So that's exciting. Um, but yeah, I did a lot of stuff outside of the bus. Like cooking isn't, I mean, I was in the desert, so I didn't have a lot of like rain or anything like that. I was in Sedona for the most part when I was living out of the, out of the Subaru. So I would just cook, like I open my back hatch up and just put my camping stove right there and just make all my meals. And it was simple. I liked it. Yeah, that's really great. So what was it like to switch to boudoir photography? Like, what was it like getting your first client and kind of going through that? Uh, honestly, it was incredibly intimidating. Boudoir is a incredible incredibly intimate, vulnerable experience. And my, I decided early on that my, my biggest concern wasn't how the photographs looked, but it was the overall experience that they had. I wanted them to walk away knowing that when they came to me, this was a safe space. So they were welcome. They were invited. Like everything about the experience from beginning to end with me was going to be safe and comfortable and, and positive. So the biggest struggle was trying to figure out like how to allow individuals to come to me and feel completely comfortable within a few minutes in order to, to get these boudoir photos because boudoir, a lot of the photos that I do are fully nude. Um, I do lingerie as well. Like I, I photo, I mean, I allow, I ask my clients to bring whatever clothes they'd like for the photo shoot. I always ask them to bring the outfit that they feel the most sexy in or the most confident in. And that's the outfit that I want to start the shoot in. And so that way we're not jumping in with just lingerie and nudity. They can kind of warm up to that. Um, but really going from commercial photography where I was doing like headshots and publications and like very posed photography that was not intimate or vulnerable. Um, it was, it was a, it was a big change and it took, I was, even though I, I try to come across as very confident in my first few shoots, I was probably just as scared, if not more scared than my clients were. But I couldn't let them know that because, of course, like I'm supposed to be creating the safe space for them. So I just had to like suck it up. And I, uh, I looked at a lot of different boudoir photographers and took some online courses and um, just like did a lot of meditation on, on how I would, how I personally would want my session to look. And, um, now I feel very confident doing the work that I do, but it, it did take, it took a little bit of time to get to this point. And were your clients people who had done boudoir photography before, or was it new and intimidating for them as well? Most of my clients, I would say um, probably like about 80% of my clients have never done boudoir before um, or any type of professional photography for that matter. Um, maybe some family portraits here and there, but a lot of my clients come and they're like, 
especially since I'm pay what you can, there's no um, pressure to pay a certain amount and it's affordable to everyone. Um, and so a lot of my clients have come to me and they are very hesitant. They're like, I don't know how to pose. I'm like, I got you. Like, I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. Um, one of the things that I, uh, one of the ways that I get women to pose for the photo shoots, I do a lot of like light movements around the body. So I'll put them into a pose and then I'll be like, what I'd like you to do is just tilt your head back and give yourself neck tickles. Just something that's so small and so sensual that like allows them to just, it's a, something so easy, but then in the photo it's, it's transformative. Like it just looks so relaxed and so at peace um, that they don't look like they're just like harsh, like standing still in a photograph. Um, but yeah, most of my clients, I would say, have never had a boudoir done before. And a lot of them, the whole reason why they're doing this is, I mean, there's a ton of reasons why they're doing this. But um, one of my biggest reasons is because post-COVID, a lot of them have fallen out of touch with themselves. And they want to, this is a way of rediscovering themselves, uh, whether that's falling back in love with themselves or falling or finding their sexuality again all of that um, I've seen in photo shoots. Can you talk a little bit about the pay what you can model that you've adopted and what that really looks like? Yeah. So um, with the pay what you can, I ask my clients to not tell me how much they're paying me prior to the shoot. I want all my clients to feel like they are getting the same exact experience. They're getting my full Sarah Marcella experience. So um, no matter where I'm at, I ask everyone, please do not tell me how much you're paying me. You, I do not accept any money prior to the shoot. Um, they can pay me as soon as the shoot's done, but no money prior to the shoot. And it's really just to create equality. And, there, and it, every single shoot is the same. It's all 45 minutes, as many outfit changes as they want, as many poses as they want. I ask the same questions to every client. Um, one of the ways that I kick off the shoot, I say, how would you like the shoot to look in three words? Like, what are three things that, you, how you would like to either feel or be perceived in these photographs? So, um, for example, like someone might say like feminine, empowered, and adventurous. Um, those are three words that I've gotten before. So I just want every client to know that when they come to a session with me, that they're all getting the same exact quality. They all get the same amount of photos. At first I had started with, um, if you paid more, you'd get more photographs, but I have no self-control. So I give, I give, I give all, I give normally anywhere from 15 to 25 photographs per session. Um, and that, that's just what I enjoy. And I've been paid anywhere from a hundred dollars for a session up to $750. And the way that I'm able to continue doing pay what you can, um, I come back to DC quite often, like two or three times a year, and I'm able to book a bunch of commercial clients and my rate is, is my regular business rate. So I don't do pay what you can for those clients. And I'm able to make enough money so that I can pay for my healthcare. I can pay for all of the bills that I have so that I can go out on the road and do the service that I'm so passionate about. Do you ever worry that like the money will go dry like while you're out there doing the pay what you can model? Yeah, like all the time. Yeah. Um, this week has been eye opening for me. Um, I had two no shows. I've only ever had three no shows in my entire eight years of being in business. One was whenever I first started my business and then two were this week. And those no shows are incredibly detrimental to this, to this, because what I do is every place that I go, every location I go, I require three individuals to book. And that way, um, there's no pressure on one individual to pay for like the gas and like for me to get to them. So when one person backs out, all of a sudden it puts everyone in a really difficult position. Even if the other clients don't know it, like it, it makes it very difficult for me to, um, to continue doing pay what you can. And, um, the no shows that I've had, I mean, one, 
uh, immediately blocked me. Like I pulled into the parking spot at our shoot and she immediately blocked me on Facebook when I told her I was there. And so it's definitely a fear. Um, I have, I have a lot of other skills that I'm able to make money when I'm on the road, if I need to, uh, I do a lot of graphic design as well. And I know that I can always, and I, I do have a good savings account. So if that were to start to dry up, I have a certain number in my head that I'm like, okay, if it gets under this amount, this is our, oh shit moment. So I, I never worry about going completely dry, but I worry about a drought. Um, and really the pay what you can is just to, the pay what you can doesn't pay for like, again, my, my insurance, my auto insurance, my health insurance, all my other bills that I have, it doesn't pay for that. It pretty much just pays for me to live on the road with groceries, um, gas, and then whatever other small expenses there might be. But my big bills all come out of the shoots that I have in DC. So I just try to make enough money with the pay what you can so that I can make sure I get to point, from point A to point B. Yeah. Well, and it's good that like you can split out your expenses in that way um, to yeah. ha- and to have that safety net. Have you ever considered adding like a $25 deposit or something? So then like if somebody yeah. knows shows, like you're like, well, at least I got 25 bucks for being here. <laughs> I just added that to my contract this week and it has been actually yesterday. I just added it. It has been, I did not want to do that. It took me a lot of time and a lot of, um, sitting with myself. I added a $50 no show fee. So, so pretty much, uh, there is a $50 deposit now. And once they come to their shoot, they get that money right back. They don't even have to give me $50 to do their shoot. Like it's all pay what you can, but that $50 is enough to hopefully deter people from not showing up to their photo shoot. Um, but yeah, I did just add that a $50 deposit because I like not only is it detrimental to me and my own like financial security, but when things like that happen, you're taking a slot from someone who really wanted it. And so specifically the no show that I had, I had a no show happen, um, two days ago and I had two other women who really wanted to shoot with me, but I didn't have space. So those two women did not get to work with me. One of them would have been able to, honestly, I probably could have fit both of them in because the shoot that I had, my next shoot was two hours later. So if that person would have just let me know, even that morning that they did not feel like coming to their shoot, I could have adjusted my schedule. Um, but yeah, I am now adding in a $50 deposit fee and it goes against my spirit <laughs> for the pay what you can, but I I've got to figure out a way to deter that from happening. And right now that's my solution. Yeah. And I think, you know, you can kind of see what happens, see if that helps. And, you know, like the reality is you're like, I'm giving you this money back when you show up. So therefore it is still exactly. pay what you can like, this money is only gone for the period in which you booked the appointment to showing up to the appointment. Um, So hopefully, hopefully that helps deter. um, And, you know, you can continue to have great shoots where people are giving you more than $50. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So you mentioned earlier that originally when you got the bus, you were doing photos inside of the bus. But now it seems mm-hmm. like that's not the case. So can you talk a little bit about where you're doing photos and how you're continuing to make it comfortable for the people being photographed? Absolutely. So I I choose places. So national parks, state parks, and private land. All of those are places that I photo that I have photo shoots on. In my contract, it does say um, that if we are shooting on public land, it's possible that we might have someone on the trail with us. So um, I make sure that all my clients, I have a conversation with them prior to the photo shoot. And I'm like, if you are uncomfortable with this at all, or at any point of the photo shoot, you feel like when you take a break or you feel uncomfortable, you just let me know. I keep a robe with me on, on hand at all times so that I can give it to them. Or if they have clothes, loose fitting clothes, we keep that close to them so that they can easily change. Um, so far, I mean, even the the times that we've had someone near us on a photo shoot, the my clients were like, 
they they have not cared. They're like, this is it's liberating for them. They're like, a lot of my clients already enjoy being naked outside, so it hasn't been a problem yet. Um, but I do make it very known prior to the shoot that if we are shooting on public land, what that looks like. And I do a lot of very um, like primitive land in places that wouldn't be hiked on. So even if we have to hike to the spot on a trail, we go off the trail far enough to be away from people. Um, and it w so when I started this, I was shooting in the bus. And what I've found is that that's very limiting. And I love shooting in nature. And not only is it limiting, but now living on the road with two pit bulls, it's just they want full attention when uh, we're in the bus. And it's just too much to try to have a photo shoot in there. So I've used different parks around different states um, and different private land. And one of the great places to shoot that I have really enjoyed is shooting on BLM land, Bureau of Land Management, which is also where I camp a lot of the times, which is very desolate. You're in the middle of nowhere and um, you can really be free without having to worry about people bothering you. So I do the way that I kind of find my locations. I go on Google Maps and I do like virtual hikes where I walk around on Google Maps through people's photos. I read reviews. I read on all trails to see how busy these trails are, the busiest times of days uh, to make sure that when I'm booking the shoot, I'm not booking during busy times of days. And it just all goes into the whole the whole process as a as a, a whole. Right. And it sounds like you're being very mindful of the whole situation, which I'm sure is that added piece of comfort for the clients. You have to be whenever you're doing something this this intimate. It, it's all about them and their comfort level. If you're not providing your photos could be or my photos could be absolutely gorgeous. But if they didn't feel comfortable during their shoot, it doesn't matter. So that's that's my top priority is is always making sure my clients are comfortable. Right. And so how do you get your clients? Um, well, I'm hoping through your podcast. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I, so I'm with a couple of groups on Facebook. I'm with a couple of groups called like Women's Van Life Collective and a couple of like specific women run groups for van lifers. And I, I get a lot of clients through that. Um, social media in general is a great way to get clients and that and like word of mouth. Um, a lot of my clients are in the van life, like nomadic community. So I do get a lot of them booking with me. Um, and then the rest just either, like I said, find me on social media. I, being in my hometown, I did one post on Facebook saying that I was here and it got shared by like nine different people. So I ended up booking like 11 or 12 shoots this week. Um, all in the area, which was fantastic because I was really just here to work on my school bus uh, before I'm starting my 5,800 mile trip across the country. I just needed some time to like regroup and get everything ready before leaving. Uh, and in that time, um, I still prepared en enough. Tonight's going to be a chore to make sure everything's ready to go, but uh, got ready and had, a, had made some money in the process, which was great because I needed that gas money to get me to my next location. Yeah. So how do you navigate social media and boudoir photography? Uh, horribly. No, I'm just kidding. Um, honestly, social media sucks for boudoir photography. Women's bodies are viewed as being, um, it's almost like a crime to show your naked body online, which is disgusting to me. Um, especially God forbid you show nipples. So most of my work already is very tasteful, but in the chance that I do post full nudity, I have to put something over the nipple. Um, I've even had some people comment, well, why don't you just photograph men's nipples on there or Photoshop men's nipples on there? And that, I'm like, that's not the, the point. The point is that like, we're a fucked society that view female nipples as being, dangerous and disgusting even though these work it, it's anyways i could get in that's a whole nother podcast um but social media is really hard for a boudoir and i found that specifically i do tag i do tag a lot of boudoir and even though i have like i don't know how many followers i have, I have over three thousand followers most of my posts only get like 
between 50 and 70 likes because I do tag so much boudoir. So I know that that's hindering um, getting out there to the public. But honestly, I feel like that this is going to sound super spiritual, like, but I feel like the right people will find me. So I just keep posting. And sometimes I don't even add tags, um, just depending on the mood that I'm in. So I might not even add tags, but I really do feel like people and individuals who need this service will find me. And um, I do a lot. I've been starting to do a lot more podcasts and getting the word out there. And I, I it's a slow process. Like, I've been doing this full time now for six months, and um, I already have quite a handful of shoots booked across the country. And as I start to do this more and more, I know that the word will spread. So it just takes time, and it's it's a game of patience. And so after this tour, do you think you'll continue to keep being mobile? Like you mentioned that your partner is currently deployed, so when she comes back and you get rid of the apartment like so what's kind of in the future for van life um that's a great question um we do plan on eventually buying our own home um she is in the military so van life is not an option um so i will i will be part-time at that point which honestly I, i am thankful for i like the flexibility um of being able to do both and i do the, the option to come back to the East Coast by flying and leaving my bus somewhere safe is very attractive because coming driving across the country like five times a year is a little too much for me. So um, though I will not be we will not be living in the van full time or the bus full time. Um, I do still even whenever we lived in California together, I would go out for weeks at a time and then come back and she's very supportive. Um, she knows that this is my passion. She knows that this is something that I feel is my calling right now. So not only will I do shorter tours where it might just be where I go out for a month at a time, I'm also planning on setting up like workshops up and down the coast of California uh, at different campsites and having women and individuals, non-binary individuals come to those campsites and hosting like a weekend long event with a chef and a yogi and maybe a meditation specialist and really making it like a self-love event. Um, Those will not be pay what you can just because we have to make sure everyone makes enough money. But that does not mean I'll stop my pay what you can model for my tours. Um, So like next year, early next year, probably in late February, I'll go ahead and do like a month tour down into Nevada and Arizona and New Mexico before coming back into California. So I'll do like little tours and then I'll probably do one or two big tours every single year. Um, So I don't see this being an end. It's just going to be, I'm just, it's just adjusting it for a lifestyle with my, with my partner. Right. It's a transition to cohabitation. <laughs> yes. Yes. Is there anywhere specific that you enjoy traveling to most for your photography? Oh, um, Yeah. I really, really, really love the desert. Did not know that about myself until like Joshua Tree and Sedona and Arizona, but I really love the desert. There's something so spiritual about it and just so, it's it, it's just so breathtaking. Um, I really thought I've lived on the coast of California in a town called Carlsbad for the past, like I lived there off and on for six months with my with my partner. And living that close to the beach. I thought I'd be going to the beach every day. I don't like, I enjoy going to the beach every now and then, but man, I love the desert. So the desert is really what speaks to me. I came from the mountains, um, of Western Maryland and I still love the mountains, but there's just something so raw, honestly, about the desert, just so different and just so exciting to me. And maybe that'll change in a year, but right now I really, really love the desert. And you mentioned, of course, that part of the thing with the desert is the spirituality and you've mentioned spirituality a lot. So what what does that like mean for you and how have you kind of. I don't really know how to ask the question I'm trying to ask, like developed. Yeah, Yeah. no, developed my spirituality. Yeah. So I was never a spiritual person before my road trip of last year, the one where I lived in my Subaru. 
Um, I've always struggled with religion. Um, I was raised Catholic um, and just never really felt connected to to the religion. And um, so I kind of just, I, I thought spiritual and religion, spirituality and religion were all one thing. I didn't know that you could have one without the other. And I decided that I was going to start turning inward and try to try to figure out if if there was some type of spirituality within my soul. And I'd always kind of like wanted that, but just didn't think it was possible without religion. And on my on my road trip, I found that spending so much time alone and having so much responsibility and so much fear and anxiety, I needed I needed some guidance. And I started I, I started looking into spirituality. And um, I would talk specifically uh, whenever I started living out of the Subaru, I would talk to her constantly because I was very fearful. And so I would just ask her for guidance and help and just letting her know that I, I was scared and just asking her for, honestly, just asking her for strength. Um, my very first night car camping, um, I went from Bend, Oregon and came down to right in the Redwoods, so upper California and took a detour to see Crater Lake. Um, Crater Lake was closed because of a snowstorm and then got lost. And the first campsite that I went to in the Redwoods, I felt very unsafe. Uh, there were, there was no one else there. There was just a gut feeling that like, I was not going to be okay there. Um, and so I left and it was probably about 11 o'clock at night. I had barely eaten that day. I just like wanted to get to a safe place. So I went to the next campsite, which was called, um, Gold's Bluffs. Gold's Bluffs, yeah, in California. And it's down this like very back road. It's like seven miles down. You turn off the, the the main road and it's seven miles of a dirt road. And I'm talking like windy, huge potholes. The morning I left, there was a boulder in the middle of the road, like crazy, crazy road. And I was like, well, definitely can't bring my bus down here. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I was really, really scared. And I kept telling myself, over and over again, I was like, you might be uncomfortable, but you're not going to die. Like, you're not going to die. And there was a book that I read prior, like on the first leg of my journey. Um, I think it was called like Unbreakable. It's about a guy who was shot down in one of the wars. He was he was a fighter jet uh, doing a drill, shot down. He lived on the ocean for like 47 days or 44 days. And then he was captured and then lived in a... Uh, at, like in a camp and was starved and all this torture happened. So I, I listened to that book on like the very first leg of my journey. And as I'm like scared at night, I'm like, man, I haven't eaten in like 12 hours. I'm like, Sarah, that guy survived like 44 days on the ocean. Like you're fucking fine. You do not need to worry about this. And so I just, I, I don't know. I just reached out to, to the universe and was like, okay, like you might be uncomfortable, but you're not going to die. Like tonight's going to suck. I froze. It was freezing out. It was like 25 degrees for some idiotic reason on my own part. I, I left my sleeping bag in the top part of my car. So in my like, what is that called? Like, you know, the storage that you put on top of your car. I left my sleeping bag up there because I thought I was getting to the campsite around like 7 PM. So I was like, I'll go ahead and get that out and like set everything up in the back. No, I got there so late. I didn't want to get out of my car because it was super windy. I was super, super, super scared. So I just decided I wasn't going to sleep with a sleeping bag. I slept in a jumpsuit that I had found in Colorado Springs. And pretty much, I mean, I don't even know if I slept that night because I was freezing so much. My, the next morning, my abs were on fire. I was like, well, this is probably better than doing 100 crunches. Just sleep in the freezing cold. Um, but again, I just like my phrase that I've always gone to is like, you might be uncomfortable, but you're not going to die. And that's really, that's, that's part of that, that, that spiritual journey that I, I started on is just learning how to believe in myself, knowing that there's something, there's a higher purpose for me, knowing that I have been placed here for some reason and whatever that reason is, I, the only way to find out is, is by trial and error, you know? So yeah.
and the the rest of the trip just continued on that kind of like on that that journey and just really turning inwards when I got scared and just understanding that like as long as my gut feeling was telling me that I was safe I would be okay and so I still I don't necessarily expect the universe to protect me from everything but um I feel like she gives guidance. That's what she's there for. So she's she helps with the gut feeling. So I listen to her a lot. And I just, if something doesn't feel right, I get the fuck out of there. And uh, yeah, so far it's been going really well. And so you've had these moments where there have been not great gut feelings or you've, mm-hmm. you've felt a little unsafe. Have there been any times when you've truly been in a situation like that you should not have been in and like, needed to get out of on your travels? Uh, Not necessarily. Um, There was one night in the Redwoods and um, I decided to go on a hike with three guys and they, I mean, they were all awesome. The two guys were really awesome that I went on this hike with, but there was an older gentleman gentleman that went with us and um, I felt really safe during the day. And then at night they invited me back to their campfire and we all like ate steak. And the one guy I really, I really like bonded with, he was in the air force. He had a German shepherd. We really hit it off. And then the older gentleman started to make some really crude, um, very inappropriate remarks to me. So um, I went back to my car and decided, and I was supposed to go have coffee with them in the morning. And I decided that as soon as I sobered up, because at that point I had had a few beers, I was like, as soon as I sober up, I'm getting out of here. And I just took off. So I probably waited like four hours, just waited in my car, slept it off, drank a shit ton of water, watched some videos on YouTube, sobered up. And then as soon as I knew that I was good to drive, I got out of there. Um, So that's probably the only time that I really felt, again, like I needed to leave a, a situation. Um, but I also haven't been on the road long enough, I would say to, to speak, like, I'm definitely not an expert on this. Um, but one of the things that I can definitely say is I travel a lot with my van fam. Uh, anytime that I can, I like to be with somebody who's in my van fam. Um, and there's probably like about a hundred of us. And then there's like little groupings of our van fam that are around and, um, when I'm with them, I know that I'm safe. So that's one of the ways that I feel very, very safe on the road is is having my my family around. And to counter that story, do you want to share like one of your best moments in traveling and van life? Yeah, I'll share the way that I met my van fam. Um, so I was I left Scottsdale, Arizona, and I was on my way to the Grand Canyon. This was in February. And I can drive, I drove from Louisville to Colorado Springs in one haul, 18 hours, no problems, never get tired at the wheel. I drive from Scottsdale to Grand Canyon, which I think is like three and a half to four hours. And I start to like legitimately not be able to keep my eyes open. And I'm like, I need coffee now. So I pull over in Sedona, go into a coffee shop and pound like the most highly caffeinated coffee that they can sell me. And I'm like, all right, we got this. And I sit in their parking lot for a little bit and I'm like, we don't have this. We don't got this. We have to find a place to stay right now. Like it has to be 10 minutes from where you are because you are falling asleep at the wheel. So I look up BLM land and I, this was my first night staying on free land, not in a campground. And I found a pull off about five miles away. So I go ahead down there and there's just all of these van lifers hanging out like all up and down the streets, uh, like these dirt roads. I'm like, Perfect. So I drive around for a little bit and then I'm like nervous. This is my first time again. One, being around this many van lifers. I have never experienced this before. And two, being on free land. Like there's no, it's primitive. There's no utilities. There's no street lights. There's no bathrooms. There's nothing. So it's just dirt roads and they're just free for you to sleep on. So I pull up next to this like group of van lifers and I'm far enough away that I'm not, I'm not intimidating to them or threatening but I'm close enough that I'm like, they can hear me scream if something happens. And I noticed that there were a few women in that campsite, like a few young women. And I'm like, okay, like they'll, like those women will protect me in my mind. I've never met these women, but like in my mind, I'm like, I don't know. I just felt the connection. So the next morning I'm packing up my stuff to leave 
and they have three dogs running around their campsite. And I'm like, I want to go introduce myself so badly. So I'm like, okay, you're already doing the hard shit, Sarah. Like you're already living out of your car. You're already pooping in the woods. Like wh- how scary could it be to introduce yourself to strangers? And I'm like, just go introduce yourself. So I go over and we start talking and we, I end up hitting it off with them. They're like, Hey, we're about to go on a hike. You want to join us? And I'm like, absolutely. I do. So I go on a hike with them. I ended up camping the next two weeks with them. Like it did not leave. I celebrated my 31st birthday with them. They gave me a birthday card that said happy birthday, mom, because my nickname with them was Shama Mama because I made sure everyone was drinking enough water and everyone was eating enough because some of them were not eating enough food. I was like, y'all are eating cereal for three meals a day and we're going on these like five mile hikes. Hell no. So I started cooking for them and just like really hit it off with this group of incredible individuals. And one of them, her name is Bethany. I met her when she was 18. And we were hiking and I hear her talking to her older brother, talking about giving him a tattoo that night. And I'm like, I'm sorry, where are you giving this tattoo? And she's like, oh, in their van. And I'm like, you're a tattoo artist. And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, um, I don't have a tattoo and I would love a tattoo. And can you give me my first tattoo? So Bethany gave me my first tattoo. That's my first one. She's given me my snake, my scorpion, and the one on my arm now. So I've gotten four tattoos from this 18 year old that I met on a hike. Um, the first two were stick and poke and the snake took about five and a half hours. And if I would have had that done with a gun, it probably would have taken 45 minutes just to put that in perspective. But yeah, I just met this incredible group of people. And then that group of people was part of a bigger van fam. And that's how I now have met all of these incredible individuals who are part of my life. So that one choice to camp near them And then that one choice to go over and introduce myself. And then that one choice to say, yes, I'll go on that hike is what actually made me get into this lifestyle. I would not be a van lifer today had I not met them because I don't think I would have ever have had this experience of just like literally living in the desert for two weeks with them and just all of us coming together at night, cooking meals together, having a bonfire. We didn't bonfire every night. That sounds very idealistic and that's not how it is all the time. Um, but we would hike and we would grocery shop together and we'd like, I would, I had the planet fitness membership. So I would once a day, I was, I was going to the gym every single day and I would take somebody from the group. So every single person was showered. Like each person got a chance to shower because again, none of us had showers. So I was like, okay, who wants to come get a shower today? Go into planet fitness. You might have to wait an extra hour. Cause I'm definitely working out. Um, and it was just like this incredible bonding moment with a, with strangers and like oh it was just so cool it was really 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 i mean it started the whole the whole process so yeah i'm very grateful yeah it definitely sounds like it and before i start to wrap things up is there anything else that you would like to share with the listeners the floor is yours um if you are somebody who's interested in van life uh i would definitely suggest looking into it even more because it really is a special, it's a very special life. It's not an easy life, but it's very rewarding. And if you are somebody who's interested in a boudoir shoot, um, you should definitely do that too, because, and find me, find me on the road. I'll come to you uh, if it's not too much in gas, but yeah, I'll come to you and we'll have an awesome shoot. And I just think that live with purpose and live with positivity. And that's it. I love it. So at the end of every episode, I do ask all of my guests a random question. My question today is, who is your role model? Oh, man. My dad. My dad is my role model. Um, I love both of my parents equally. I love my mom just as much. She's been a role model as well for female empowerment to me. But my dad is also a photographer. And um, not only that, but he he's really helped guide me along the way and t- has taught me a lot about the bus and um, and how to work on things. So I think at the, at the end of the day, I have to say both of my parents are my role model because my mom has done just as much with female empowerment in me. Um, I grew up where my dad was a stay-at-home dad and my mom was the one that was working full-time. 
And so my parents definitely instilled a different non-traditional style of life um, for me growing up. And I learned that like women are very powerful and uh, yeah, yeah, my parents are my role models. All right, that brings this episode to a close. If you'd like to connect with Sarah, of course, I will be leaving her website in the description along with her Instagram. So if you want to check out the great photography work she is doing and where she is going and where she will be, that information is there on her website and her Instagram. And if you'd like to connect with the podcast, our website is in the description as well. That brings you to all of our social media LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. So if you'd like to go follow those pages, that is there along with all of our past episodes and resources and ability to connect with other guests that have been on the podcast. If you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, my email is there. Feel free to reach out. I always love meeting new people and talking about different talks of life. And if you'd like to support the podcast monetarily, a link to do that is is in the description as well. Thank you so much, Sarah, for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time, bye. Peace out.